Good evening, everyone. Today, uh, I will not speak about the parasha. Maybe if later we'll have time, we'll do something. But right now, I wanted to speak about something else today. As you all know, there was a massive earthquake in Nepal and India, parts of India. And they say that they have uh, thousands of uh, dead people, plus a lot of missing ones. Even uh, 100 Israelis, as of this morning, still did not contact their families. One way it's possible, because the internet collapsed, there's no phone. You know how these things is. When there's a massive earthquake, it may take sometimes days until it comes back. When the, when the tragedy hits in Nepal, back in the time it was in uh, the tsunami there in uh, Thailand and India and all these places, I have a, an assistant that helps me with my Facebook page. He lives in India. And uh, he lives, he's surrounded by millions of idol worshippers. You know, as you know, in India, they worship the cow and other gods, men, men, gods, you know, gods, all kinds of statues. And they actually worship people. They have people, they make them into gods. There's all different kinds of things. We're not expert in, uh, expert in Hinduism and Buddhism and the rest of the cults in those places. You, you need many, many years to learn to know the differences between the idol worshipings. But he lives over there, and from time to time, he sends me proofs for certain things that I say in my lecture. This is, this is a person who is supposed to come here to New York to convert to Judaism, he wants to go into yeshiva. He's a, he's a brilliant student for, for finance. So yesterday, he sent me a picture of a temple, very fancy temple of idol worshiping in Nepal over there that collapsed. The buildings around it, they were still standing. But this temple of the idol worshippings became sand, all mamash sand, nothing left from it. it was, they show you a picture before, how it was, you know, with all these roofs and all the statues inside. Nothing left from it, not one wall, not, not one piece, nothing, mamash like sand. So what did I do? I posted that uh, picture on my Facebook page. It's my Facebook page. It represents the Torah. We put things from the Torah there for years. And I wrote one, ti one title, a Temple of Idol Worshipping worshiping is now totally destroyed. That's it. Then write, thank God people died, or we're happy that people died. Nothing of the above. No one is happy when people die. No one is wishing anyone bad. This now wasn't the case, Bechlal. But as, a, as people who follow the Torah, one of the most important mitzvot in the Torah is to hate idol worshippings. To hate, and not only to hate, even to make fun at them, it's mitzvah. The Torah is very sensitive. The Torah said never to make fun at anyone. Never to start, no, not to fight, not to make fun, not to insult people. You know, someone who embarrasses his friend has no share to the world to come. You can see that the Torah was very, very sensitive not to insult each other and not to hurt people's feeling. But when it came to idol worshippings, the Torah didn't say you have to hate the idol worshippers because they're bad people. Maybe they have a heart of gold. Maybe they're mistaken. Maybe they brainwash. Maybe they're just naive. Maybe that's what the parents taught them. Whatever the case is. Nobody comes and says, oh, they're bad people. Bad people, someone who comes to kill you and you're innocent, he wants to murder you. He wants to take everything you have. That's people that are a threat to you. We are not talking completely spiritually right now. There is one God to the world. He's a very zealous God, as you can see in the Torah. There's hundreds of examples in the Torah, what happened in the past in cases like that. And, and when he gave us, the Jewish nation, his Torah, the Torah include in it the seven laws of Noah which applies to the Gentiles. The Torah is not only for the Jews. The Torah is for the Jews and for the non-Jews. The Torah educated the non-Jews that before God gave the Torah to the Jews, he actually gave six laws to Adam, which was the first human being on earth. Everyone who is in this world eventually was born from him. He told Adam six laws. 
after the flood, when Hashem wiped out the world from all the wicked people, he started a world again 4,200 years ago with Noah and his three sons and their wives. Eight people started a war, a, a new world. And after the flood, when Noah came out, God added one more law to it, which is Ever Minachai. Ever Minachai means you cannot eat an animal before you kill it first, as a non-Jew. They don't need to slaughter it. They don't need to follow the laws of Jews when it comes to kosher, non-kosher animal. The non-Jews are allowed to eat whatever they want in one condition. What is the condition? There's only one law by them when it comes to food. That before you eat, you eat it, make sure you kill it. You don't eat it when he's alive. Let me give you an example. I had one time a chef in my house for Shabbat. He went to a special school in Manhattan to be a chef, a professional chef. And he said over there that in school, you know, you'll, you'll, they teach you how to cook certain things. So they take the lobsters, different kind of lobsters. I'm not experts with their names. Some of them, they actually cook them when they are alive. They cook them when they are alive, and they cut pieces from them when they're still alive. They take this piece off, they take this piece off. That's called Ever Minachai. This is exactly what God said to the Goim, to the non-Jews, not to do. You want to eat, you can eat whatever you want. Even dogs, they're allowed to eat. I mean, yeah, we get disgusted when you hear about it. How can you eat a dog or a cat? But they say it's our tradition. This is what we eat for, for thousands of years. You tell us what to eat, what not to eat. How can I tell them what to eat? It's not against the Torah. The Torah didn't say that the Goim not allowed to eat specific things. The Torah only say, when they want to eat something, it has to be dead before. That's why today, in some countries, like in China, if you remember once we posted a video that they take the dogs when they're still alive, they throw them in boiling water, and they take off the skin from them. It's easier to take the skin off when they're alive, because after they die, the skin is attached. It's very hard to take. They throw them in boiling water, which is horrible suffering, tsar ba'alechaim. The animals suffer. They take off the skin from the head like this, and the, the animal is still alive with no skin. You know, and they begin to cut them. That's called ever minachai. The goyim allow, they can shoot an animal, hunt it, or with a bone and arrow, or with a knife, or with electric. Whatever they do, they allow. If they kill the animal first, they're allowed to eat. That's called nevela, dead body of an animal a Jew is not allowed to eat can only eat something that is kosher to begin with, a pure animal, and there's a list of pure animals, and has to be slaughtered with laws of the Torah from the neck. Got to put salt, get rid of the urine and the blood that is absorbed in the body. Everything has to come out. You wash it. There's laws in kosher. Nothing has to be broken. The bones, the lung of the animal has to be smooth with no holes. There's rules. The, the Goindos don't have it. The Arabs, for instance, they also copy some of the written Torah. They say, in order for you to eat meat, you have to eat halal meat. What does it mean? It means that the animal was slaughtered. But what about all the laws, how you check the animals, how you check the knife, where you slaughter, all these laws that the Jews have, the lung has to be smooth. They don't have all these laws because they never had the Talmud. They never had the oral Torah. And you can only read in the written Torah that God said that you have to slaughter the animal, and that's how you do it. How to do it, what to do it, when to do it, they don't know any. So for them, everything that was slaughtered doesn't matter how they eat. It's called halal meat. That's why when the Jews sla says, slaughter an animal, and it came that the animal is not kosher, there's a hole in the lung, all kinds of other problems, they right away sell it to the Arabs. They call the Arabs, they already have an agreement. Everything that we slaughter that would come not kosher, you come and take it. For them, it's halal meat. And they sell it right away in the place. That's one of the reasons in the world that Arabs always come to live next to the Jews. Of course, Hashem designed it like that because he wanted them to be our policemen, to put some fear on that, to do tshuva. Because when you get scared, you do tshuva. That's the, way, the human nature. When everything is beautiful and you're not under pressure and no one threatens you, you're not exactly worried about the law so much. When the police is closing on you, all of a sudden you become a, a good citizen. You drive slow, you're afraid to get arrested. The, you feel the pressure. 
But the, really, the, the natural reason is because the Arabs, when they want to move to a place, they want halal meat. Not everywhere they have it. So if they cannot find halal meat, where are they going to find meat that they can eat? By the Jews. They come to the kosher butcher and they buy meat. Why? It's good for them. You know? So that's what they need. So that's why in Toronto, they move where their Jews live. And Montreal, same thing. All over the world, wherever the Jews are in different communities, if there's no Arabs there, if somebody looking to move to that city, he would locate himself close to the butcher area, where you can find halal meat or kosher meat, one of the two. But Arabs are not idol worshippers. Even though the Quran, they claim that God gave it to Muhammad, we know he never gave it to him. It's full of human errors. It's not a book of God. But the Quran never told the Arabs that follow it that they have to believe in somebody else besides God. Even though they believe Muhammad was a prophet, it's a false prophet. To believe in a false prophet, it's, it's a sin. It's a problem. But it's not that you worship that idol. They don't bow down to Muhammad. They don't say you cannot connect to Allah without uh, connecting first to Muhammad or things like that. So therefore, they are following a man-made religion, but they are not idol worshippers. And it makes a very big difference on the status of a Gentile if he's an idol worshipper or not. Now, of course, everything I tell you, I'm going to read to you from the Maimonides, from the Rambam, some of the laws that we must know as Jews that is applying to our everyday life. And, uh, and the reason I start, decided to talk about it, because after I posted my post, there were many, many comments, and a lot of people became angry. They got outrageous. They started to complain, why did you say that the idol worshiping place is destroyed? Who was the complainers? 99.9% .9 of them were Jews. All these liberal Jews, as usual, nothing has changed. This is, by the way, one way to know if you belong to the real Jewish nation or you belong to the Erev Rav. Doesn't matter what your status, you can call yourself a rabbi, you can still be 100% Erev Rav. The Gaon Mivilna said, for Mashiach come, many Erev Rav people will call themselves rabbis. And how do you know which one is a real pure kosher Jew from the Jewish nation and which one is from the Erev Rav? How do you know? There's no way to know 100%. But one indication is, if you have solidarity and you always endorse and support wicked things, such as gays. Someone who support them, you know this person is not a pure soul. He cannot support something that God hates so much. If you support something that God is so despite, despites it so much, and it's so despicable in his eyes, some things about you is not pure. You have to check who you are. You can call yourself call politically correct, it's humanity, all kinds, it's the 21st century, excuses you can have until tomorrow. But I love something that God hates, something about me is not proper. Now I'm not talking, please don't misunderstand me, I'm not talking someone who makes sins that the Torah say you should not do, because some sins, it's a matter of, of desire. Person uh, has a girlfriend. Hashem says you cannot have relationship with a woman before you marry her. It's not allowed. It's a very big sin. To Jews, for non-Jews, it's not a sin. For Jews, it's a very, very big sin. It's a sur karet. The soul gets cut because she's impure. She's nida. She doesn't go to the mikveh. So therefore, boyfriend and girlfriend is a very, very big sin. But if a man made a sin with her, he doesn't make the sin because he disrespects God or disagree with God or he hates him. It's pure desire, like you put non-kosher food in front of a religious man, he's so hungry, he didn't eat all day, and he's smelling the shish kebab, not kosher one, and he, in the end he ate it, and then he regrets, he has guilty feelings. The fact that he did the sin doesn't put him in a category that he's in oppos opposition to Hashem, that Hashem says it's not kosher, it's not allowed, and he says, I disagree with you. No, he knows he violated the rule out of desire. Do you understand the difference? There's a difference between, it's called over averot le te'avon. There's an expression to it in halacha. Over averot le te'avon. Te'avon means appetite. He has appetite, he, he wants to fulfill his desire, 
Therefore, he makes scenes. We are not talking about this kind of sinners. That's a different category. We are now talking about someone that read things in the Torah, and this is what he say, Lom kubal alai. I disagree. I disagree with that. But what do you mean, who you are? Who do you think you are? The creator of the world gave a book, and he said that he despites it. Make sure you're on the same track with him, on the same side. You on the other side, you oppose the Borei Olam, the creator of the world. You're a wicked person. And wicked person has consequences with that. What do you think? Nobody gets away with his ideology or things that he say and speak and support or is against God. Whether you're a Jew, whether you're a non-Jew. Any act of a human being that is against God, against the law of nature, against his creation, against, against his Torah, against his instruction, against his ideology, every act that contradicts in words and in action the Torah, in other words, you spread the opposite of what the Torah say, there's no bigger wicked criminal than you in the whole world. You should know that. That's a fact. This is what the Torah says. You like it, fine. You don't like it, you have a major problem. But let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. The Torah says, when the place of idol worshipping is destroyed, it's very big celebration to the world, to God, and to his children. We even have a blessing in it in Judaism. Baruch oker avodah zara me'olamo. Bless you, God that cut out the idol-worshipping places from his world. It's so bad that a person cannot even look one second on the places of the idol-worshipping. In reality, if you walk in India or in Nepal and you see people that are idol-worshippers, you have to move your face. You're not allowed to look at that. You're not allowed to look at that. You're not allowed to think about it. And you're not allowed, in, not by any mean, to support it or understand it or show any empathy to that. Any one of the above that I mentioned is a huge, not small, huge crime against God. If there's something he hates more than anything, by far, is idol worshippers and idol worshipping. You can come and say, I don't believe in the Torah. I believe in Buddha, you can say that. A guy. We can argue with him and prove to him who is right, Buddhism or the Torah. That's a different argument. Believe, doesn't believe. But someone who comes and says, of course I believe that God gave the book. I even keep some of the mitzvot. And then he actually endorses in writing or in speaking or in any possible way idol worshippers, such as Christian church, which is idol worshipping, Buddhism, Hinduism, and many other cults who worship idols, he is a very, very, very big criminal against Hashem. Even if he keeps Shabbat, even if he eats kosher, even if he gives donation, even and even and even and even until tomorrow, you support idol worshiping, you have empathy to that, you feel bad for the idol worshippers, you are a criminal against Hashem. Make sure you choose the right side. You want to show empathy to people who bow down to pieces of metal and to bow down to animals and to believe in the stars and to believe in the moon and to believe in trees and to believe in all kinds of nonsense that is a major violation against the book of God. You're going to pay a price that you cannot even believe what price you're going to pay for that. If you don't believe what I say, open the Torah and begin to read. One verse, clear verse in the Torah, Moshe Rabbeinu said to the, Jew, to the Jewish nation, moment after they came out of Egypt, Enechem aro'ot et asher asa Hashem lebal peor. Moshe said to the Jewish nation, there was an idol called Baal Peor, that the Goim used to take their waste, what they do in the bathroom, and sacrifice it to that god of a statue called Baal Peor. And some of the Jews, after coming out of Mitzrayim, Moshe said to them, your eyes saw that not one of the Hebrews and the Jewish people who follow the Baal Peor, Avodah Zarah, idol worshiping, not even one survived. 
Not one of them stayed alive. Now, if Moshe's statement was incorrect, nobody would agree to continue listen to him. What, we have a leader that is a liar? He's standing in front of us and he tells us all the Jews who follow the idols, they're all dead. Here, here is one, here is another one, here is another one. What are you saying that not one survived? They're all around. The fact that Moshe came and, stand, and stood on the front of millions of people in a Jewish nation, and he told them, where are all the Jews who followed the idols? Even one of them did not survive. And that was a fact. So the Exodus of Egypt, you have a verse in the Torah. Enechem haroot, your eyes saw what Hashem did to all the idol worshippers and the Jews who followed them. Not one of them survived, and that's a fact. Now we're going to read some of the laws. I didn't write the laws. I want to remind each one of you. When I speak, I speak what the Torah say, not what my opinions say. Other people, when they speak, they bark a lot, but they don't even think what they say. They just say what their heart say. Their heart, feelings. They feel bad. It's normal, it's human to feel bad. When you see a tragedy, you see thousands of people are dying, they lose everything they have, it's human to feel bad. The Torah already told us, that's it, the people have heart, they have feelings. Nobody wish bad to anyone, unless if he comes to kill you, is not your direct enemy. The idol worshippers in India, in Nepal, in China, in all these places, are not our enemies. In fact, the Arabs that are not idol worshippers, they are much bigger enemies to us and once wish for our destruction, much more than the Chinese people or the people of Nepal or the people of Burma or, the, or, or all the other idol worshippers. But we don't, it's not politics. Oh, he hates me more, so I should speak more against the Arab. The people from Nepal, they like us more, they are friends, so we should be our friends and, and feel empathy for them. It doesn't work this way. Feelings, it's not a factor when it comes to analyze the truth of God in the Torah. Feelings have to be paused, on hold, put them aside. Now we have to check what's the instruction. Believe me, God has feelings more than you and me, much more. And he writes in the Torah, when he punishes a Jew, he cries about the Jew more than the Jew cries for himself. Bechol tsaratam lo tsar. And Hashem said, Many, many times I threw my anger in the temple and other things instead of destroying my children for betraying me, I ended up throwing my anger on woods and, uh, and metals to destroy my home instead of punishing them for what they deserve. So we see that before Hashem punish, He does everything He can not to punish. He sends hints and another one and another one and another one until we get to what we call in halacha. Until we came to the, to, the, to the top. That's it. Now there's no more to store our sins. It came to the top. That's when we get the punishment. This is how it goes. So now, the people that were writing over their comments, many of them I had to throw them out of my page. I'm not interested in people like this in my page. I don't want idol worshippers on my page. I can understand a Jew that commits sins because he has desire. Not that I support what he does, but at least I can understand, because desire, we, we are half animals, we have desires, that's what it is. But ideology, criminals, that go directly against Hashem, I need them in my page. Why do I need them in my page? What's the point of even talking to these people? So then I had to throw a lot of them out of the page today. That's how you find out which liberal anti-God people you have in your page, and some of them has a yamaka. But let me share with you some of their comments. One comment, first of all, as I say to you, nobody wrote over there that they wish them bad or we're happy that what ha happened to them. After all, we are people, we see what happened to them, we feel bad, especially we that suffer more than any other nation in history. So to see people that the way they are, of course we would prefer that they will be righteous Gentiles and Hashem wouldn't punish them. But to come and say it's coincidence, earthquake, by itself it happens. Innocent people are dying, nobody gets nothing. It's Marash Russian roulette. He died accidentally. He got saved accidentally. This is against the Torah. Put your 
packed together and you act together. Are you with Hashem or are you against Him? By making comments, you have to think a million times before you say or write it. Because you're going to be hold, held responsible for those comments, especially when you put them in the public. When you write, there's no such thing, there's nothing wrong with idol worshipping. The Gentiles can worship anyone they want, that's not on our business. You're actually making a big lie on the public. That's against the Torah. It is a very big sin for the Gentiles to worship idols. It's one of the seven laws. What's the punishment for that? Execution. Execution for the Gentiles. The Gentiles can eat whatever they want. It's not, not a sin. They can leave boyfriend, girlfriend as much as they want. It's not a sin. Certain things that for us is a huge sin, for them it's not a sin. But when the Gentiles worship idols, it is a huge sin for them. Huge. And that's why, if you pay attention, you don't have to believe me. Check the record of all the earthquakes and the natural disasters. Where are they all taking place? Japan, Nepal, Thailand, India, all these places of all the massive idol worshipping. Now again, maybe millions of these idol worshippers, that's how they were brought up. They don't know any better. But a human being is created with Hashem's image and he has a human logic. How come my guy in India, even before he met me, realized something is wrong with the people of my nation? How can they bow down to a cow? How can they fight who's going to drink the urine of the cow and they buy it in a pharmacy paying a lot of money? How can they do these things? He was clever enough to realize that these people, something is not right about what they do. You make a statue, you build it, and then you think that this statue is going to help you? For that, you don't need to be religious. It's a matter of common sense. Please don't forget that Abraham Avinu realized, Abraham realized that it's wrong before the Torah was given. When he saw these idol worshippers, that's what got him to think it cannot be. It has to be a creator of the world. Where is he? I must search for him. And that's what got him to search for Hashem, and Hashem came to him. And once he discovered Hashem, Hashem didn't give him anything easy. He had to have 10 different difficult tests. Only when he passed the 10th test, which means he was ready to take and sacrifice his son Isaac, and it was a test, of course, that wasn't the intention. That's when the Torah say, I now declare you as a fearful person from Hashem, a righteous person. But before that, before that, the Torah say, after those things that happened already, Hashem came and tested Abraham again. What was the test? Before he told him, I don't want people to sacrifice their children to their gods, to their fake gods. Speak to them to stop. They were all going. There's no Jews yet in the world. There's no Torah yet. But it was against the seven law of Noah. And Abraham is after Noah. Everybody knew about this, but they still did it. So Abraham started to give them speeches against the sacrificing their children. And what happened in the end? Hashem came to him and said, take your son and slaughter him. That was much like a, a real smack to the face. You've been training me for years to do one thing, and now you come to tell me to do the opposite thing? How can it be? But that's what, what's so great about him. But when Hashem gave them an opposite order than what he told him so far, he didn't even dare to say a word because he knew he's dealing with Hashem. If it was another person, well, of course Abraham would tell him, excuse me, sir, you've been saying for five years this, and now you're coming to say to do the opposite? Put your thoughts together, which one of the two is correct? But he knew he's dealing with God. And when you deal with God, he tells you to do something, you don't mix your own opinion. And of course, later on, he saw that it was only a test. It was never the intention to sacrifice son. Just testing him. Are you faithful to me 100% or you mix your own opinion and your own feelings? It's illegal to mix your own opinions against God's instructions. It's a crime. You can debate with another person about math, about history, about sport, about politics. No problem. That's the way the world is. Everyone is entitled to his opinion. 
But as soon as you see that your opinion is against a clear verse from the Torah or one of the 613 laws, as soon as you find what you're saying is against the law, even if you support and believe in it one million percent in your heart, you must make your mouth mute and make your hands stay still, don't move your fingers, don't type, don't publish anything. You will do it, you're going to pay the price, and the price will be tremendous, because it's not a little sin. You endorsing idol worshiping against the real God? You're not afraid of what's going to happen to your soul when you leave this world? Do you even understand how long your punishment's going to be and how severe they're going to be? So someone like me who try to save you from a, a eternal destruction, instead of saying, that you don't need, you don't need to be grateful, but at least to be quiet, what do they do? Come on my page and write endorsement and support to all the idol worshippers and speak against me or and against the Torah also. Not only against me, making comments against the Torah and against Hashem. And he called himself Orthodox. Orthodox like that, who needs them in the world, I'm asking you. They are the one who makes the damage. They want to say things that people would give them a tap on their shoulder. You're great. You're humanic. You're very nice. Everyone agree with you. You always make everyone smile and happy. We all love you. But is it the truth? That's the question now. Yes, politicians, they make everyone likes them. That's the goal. But is it the truth or not? It's the truth of the Torah. Are we allowed to endorse idol worshippers? That's not what the Torah says. So you have to decide, are you religious or not? If you're not religious, it's one thing to violate the rules of Hashem. But many of the non-religious people that I know and say, listen, Rabbi, I know the Torah is from Hashem. But what do you want from me? It's hard for me. No, at least he's honest. He's not claiming that he's a rabbi. But to come and claim that you're an authority and publish things against simple rules that every fool should know, what do you do? You mix the people that are ignorant. They do not know anything. The people that are ignorant, when they read two people that call themselves orthodox, one say, the temples of the idols are destroyed because Hashem destroyed it, and the other one writes, no, they did nothing wrong. So which Torah are you learning from? I don't know. I mean, in my Torah, it's written at least 10 times that I remember of how much God hates Avodah Zarah. If you remember, five years ago, there were a huge scandal in the Jewish world about the Whigs. One person made a statement that all the Whigs almost come from Italy by certain importer that buy all the hair, human hair, from India idol worshiping temples that the poor Indians don't have money to give. So they shave their head and they sacrifice to their gods, to their idols, they sacrifice their hair. And the, the, the monks over there, what are they going to do with all this hair? So they sell them to this designer from Italy who make us to make human hair wigs. And they ended up here in Borough Park in Flatbush and the rest of New York. As soon as Rav Eliashiv said that those wigs are not allowed, you saw all over New York women that will never dare to wear snood in the public, only wigs. They all came to school to work without the wigs. Not only that, there was one girl in school that came, and as soon as she found out in a class that the teach, they asked the teacher, her teacher, why you didn't come with your wig like every, like every day? We never saw you with a, with a cover like this. So she told them about what Rav Eliashiv Pasak, that these wigs are tikrovet avodah zara, that they sacrifice this hair to the idols and a Jew is not allowed to enjoy from it. No one is allowed to enjoy from it. It's something they gave to a fake god. As soon as the girl heard, she took off her wig. Nobody in the class knew she has a wig. Little girl that have cancer. Nobody knew. She took off her wig and stayed bald, and all the kids were shocked. Do you know the embarrassment for girls to take the wig off that nobody knows? They, they thought it's a hair. 
She took the wig, and everyone was shocked, even the teacher. And she said, if the rabbi says it's from idol worshiping, I don't want this on my head. She took it off in the middle of the class. The teacher, she came prepared from work. The girl was caught by surprise. She took it off. Let's see some of the laws that the Torah say. For those of you who are ignorant and never heard the laws of idol worshiping, it's time at least once in your life to know what you do wrong. Because this is a very, very, very heavy sin. In the Jewish law, idol worshiping and mechalel Shabbat, breaking the covenant with Hashem, are more or less equal. Both of them is death penalty by stoning. Both of them, the soul gets cut out of the eternal life. Both of them is onesh karet. Both of them has the worst physical punishment and the biggest scares that a person can get from God in his life. Being a Shabbat violator and being an idol worshiper. Let's see why. Let me read to you. I'm reading to you the laws of idol worshipings in the Rambam Maimonides chapter 7. Let's read one by one and we get some idea. It's a mitzvah from the Torah, one of the 613 laws, to destroy any idol that exists. Any idol. And everything that supports that idol, the building, the table, everything that without it, the idol wouldn't be able to be here. <laughs> And everything that was sacrificed to it, that was done for it. Somebody gave fruit to it, somebody put gold there, whatever it was, you're not allowed to enjoy that gold. You have to destroy it from the world. Well, it's a million dollar worth of gold someone just put to his idol. Let me take it, let me melt it, let me give it to my Bukharian friends in 47th Street to make some money, business is bad. Why not? Not allowed, very big sin. Not allowed. Shenemar, where does it say it in the Torah? Abed te'abdun et kol ha-mekomot. Destroyed, when you come to the Holy Land, Hashem said, there are seven despicable nations that live there. All of them idol worshippers. Besides all the other crimes that they commit. Their specialty is... They sit in the Holy Land and they sacrifice to their fake gods, their idols, and make me very angry. First thing you will do once you occupy the land, after I'm letting you win the war and occupy the land, you will destroy every memory of their idols. All the buildings, the altars, the idol themselves, Abed te abdun, do not leave any memory from that. Don't replace it, don't melt it, don't use it. Nothing, destroy it. Ah, it's a billion dollar temple, destroy it. Not only destroy it, dig the ground also. Even the ground is filthy. Why? These people betrayed me, these Gentiles. Do not leave any memory from them. Shenemar, ki im kota sulaem, etc. You actually, Israel. Now, in Eretz Israel, it's mitzvah to chase them, not give them one second of rest until we destroyed everything they did. Out of Israel, we, are, we don't have an obligation to run and destroy their temples. We leave it to God to do. In Israel, it's our job. It's our holy land. We are in charge of it. God gave it to us, and he ordered us, don't leave any place of idol worshipping in my land. But out of Israel, it's not your responsibility. It's their problem. They have to do it, not you. What's the difference? Let me explain. The Torah says, hara mikirbecha. Clean the bed from among you. Clean the bed from among you, but not in other places. Where is from among you? You live in the Holy Land or in the Jewish communities. If there are idol worshiping or idol places and you have the power to remove it and destroy it, you must do it. Now, he continued the Rambam. Mitzvah be'eretz Yisrael lirdof achareya. To chase it, not to give it a rest. To make clothes, police come. You must close this place. What do you mean? 
We believe in the same God like you. What? I'm Christian. Yeah, but you have all these idols over here, and you believe in JC, and you believe that God has a son, and he's a God. You cannot be in a holy land. If the Mashiach would come, first thing he will do, he will not leave any memory from all these ancient churches and temples that they have, the Buddhists, and all kinds of other temples that they have in Israel. That's against the laws of the Torah. Right now, the Israeli government, they're afraid from world controversy. What are they going to do? The whole world is going to shake. And plus, they themselves are not religious, so what do they care? It doesn't bother them to see nice, beautiful architecture churches. It doesn't bother them. But if it would be strictly religious government, they would not leave it for a second. Because it's against the Torah. Remember, it's not what's good for me or not. Even if the United States government would say, okay, okay, hey, you're becoming too fanatic, the government, too religious. We'll give you a billion dollar extra every year to the aid. Don't touch the churches. We're not allowed to listen to them. God comes before Obama and his friends. You understand? I'm telling you what the laws are. If we are strong enough to do it one day, I doubt it. Probably not. Until Mashiach would come, that's a status quo. Nothing is going to change. But at least let's know what God said to do. We need to know these things, no? At least once in our life to know. Let's see. So it says like this. All place in the world that we will occupy in a war, milchemet mitzvah. We go to a war, we occupy. Let's say we occupy Lebanon. And over there, there's idol worshiping places. We have the same obligation to destroy it. Why? Because now we live there. We occupy the place. We occupy the place. The Torah says, Don't leave anything, any idols among you. So every place that you live in, and now you're the original owner of the place now, you're the new owner, I should say. From now on, you have the same obligation to purify the place from all the idols. Well, we're here now, right now, to learn what the law is. What is the law of God? It's very strange that Arabs understand how terrible it is to be idol worshippers, and Orthodox, Oy vey, such Orthodox, they call themselves Orthodox, they have this chutzpah to call themselves Orthodox Jews. Orthodox Jews are screaming, give the idol worshiper empathy and freedom, go and help them. Help them to rebuild the place of the idol worshiping. And again, listen, I'm not coming and saying that these idol worshipers are doing it to get God angry. Maybe they have no idea. Maybe they don't know there is a God. Maybe whatever the reason is, maybe they brainwash. Maybe it's their culture. They grew into it. The Torah did not d d differentiate between one to another. No different. Whether it's intentional idol worshiping, not intentional, whether they have a purpose to go against God, whether no, there's no difference in the law. The law is there's idols, you got to get rid of them. And this is what it says. Vibadeta et shmam mina makom au. Destroyed not only the place, shmam, destroyed a memory, a name. If you destroy the whole store, but the sign is still there outside. Still make sure there's no memory that this place ever existed there. If you find the place was destroyed by itself, meaning hurricane, natural, fire, whatever, you have to make a bracha. There's a bracha in halacha, bracha. Were well, we going to say the name of Hashem for nothing? It's a, it's, one of the, it's a violation of the Ten Commandments to say the name of God in vain. What's the bracha? Baruch she'akar olamo. It's in the Gemara. She'okar avodah zara me'olamo. Bless you that take out the idol out of his world. The Rambam continue. The second provision, idol worshippings and everything that relates to that and is sacrificed to it, and everything that is done for it, asur be'ana. A Jew is forbidden to enjoy from it in any possible way. You cannot take it and use it for your table at home. You cannot use it for your car. You cannot use it in your garden or in your business. Or if they make from the hair wigs, you're not allowed to use this wig. It's called Asur Be'ana. What happened if somebody gave it to you as a gift, 
Somebody brought you a Buddha statue, pure gold, worth twenty thousand dollars. You don't believe in it, so you said, "Let me make some money." I don't believe in it. Hey, Mr. Lee, come. I have a gift for you. Twenty thousand. It's yours, right? You allowed to sell it? No. But Rabbi, I don't believe in it. You see that I don't want to keep it. I don't even want to bring it into my home. But at least let me make some money. I'll buy with the money some tefillin mezuzot, give it to the people that don't have. Not allowed. Not allowed. Ah, but it's a million dollar. Not allowed. Billion dollar. Not allowed. He will pay for all the yeshivot in the next hundred years. What's the big deal? Hashem knows that we don't believe in this nonsense. Not allowed. This is how much God despites it. Not only the idols are not allowed. The things that they bring and put in front of it, they put an orange there. You cannot touch it. Look how severe it is. And the next thing, Sheneemar, where is the source in the Torah? Lo tavi to'evail betecha. Don't bring anything despicable into your home. Everyone who enjoy in one of these is violating two sins from the Torah. Two restrictions, not one, two. One you should not bring, that's one violation. And the other one, lo idbak beyadcha meuma min acherem. After you destroy the places of the idol worshippers, nothing from what they own should stick to your hand. Don't take the gold, don't take the cash, don't take the wood, the beautiful things that are hanging there, the chandelier, whatever. Nothing. Rabbi, we'll put the chandelier in the shul. We'll sanctify it. Until now, it was here. Now we'll put it in the shul. We're going to make the shul look a lot better. Why? To destroy such a beautiful chandelier. It's half a million dollar handmade chandelier by this designer. Not allowed. Look at this. Not allowed. An animal that was sacrificed to an idol, you cannot enjoy from that animal, from the skin of it, from the horns of it, from the teeth, from anything that this animal has, you're not allowed to enjoy. Everything, even the skin, even the tail, even things that usually you throw to the garbage, it's a big deal, I'm giving it to my dog to eat. I'm not enjoying from it. You're giving it to the dog, it saves you one dollar on the dog's meat. You enjoy from it. It's a sin from the Torah, not rabbinical, directly from the Torah. If somebody say to you, okay, eat pork, eat pork, if not, I'm charging you one dollar. Would you give him a dollar to leave you alone? Of course, you don't want to eat pork. So if you use it for your dog, you save yourself one dollar, so it's like you're eating, <laughs> you're eating pork for one dollar. Same thing, it's a sin from the Torah, that's a sin from the Torah. Therefore, if there is a sign on a skin that his animal was used for Abu Dazara, like they used to make a, a circle, a, a cut, a round cut, and they take the heart out, that's what they used to do. They used to make a cut in a, in a place where the heart of the animal is and take the heart of it out. Everyone, so in other words, they say now, how do you know when you come to a place which animal, there's lots of animals over there, now you burn the place, some of the animals are on the floor. You want to take their skin and use it. How do you know which one was used for Avodah Zarah and not? If you don't know, the rule is, Safek de Oraita lechumra. When you have a doubt, you don't take risk when it comes to violation from the Torah. But there is a way to know. Because they, has, they used to have a hole here where they take the heart first and then they sacrifice. So if you see animals with a, with a cut in the chest, then you know that animal was already dedicated for Avodah Zarah. For sure, you cannot take anything from that animal. Now, what's the difference between idol worshipping of the Gentiles to other worshipping of Israel, of the Jews? The idol worshipping of the Gentile, you cannot enjoy from it in any possible way. Sheneemar, where does it say it in the Torah? Pesilei Elohehem tisrefu ba'esh. Burned on fire all their statues. 
שפסלו נעשה לו אלוה. All these statues that they make and they bow down to it, they, they treat it as their god. But the idol worshiping of a Jew is not asura be'ana'a. You're not allowed, of course, to, to, you know, to worship it or to let it stay. But if a Jew made a statue, but he did not have the chance to worship it yet, not yet, and you caught it on time, you can melt the gold and use it. If he bowed down to it once, that's it. You have to destroy it as well. So what's the difference? When a gentile makes it, right as soon as he begins to make it, in his mind is already his God. I'm making it for the temple. The Jew, you don't know for sure, not necessarily. Maybe first he make it and, uh, to sell it or whatever the case is, and all of a sudden he himself fell into the cult. You never know. But if it was done once, one second, $100,000 gold. One time he went like this. 100,000 goes to the garbage. You understand? This is how much to have empathy to idol worshippers. But wait, we didn't even start yet. Someone that makes idols for others. He doesn't believe in it, but he's a manufacturer. He makes statues and get paid. What do you do with a person like this? He made the idol, and somebody, I don't know, from India went and bought it. And he got paid for that. Does he have to destroy that money or no? Yeah. He doesn't believe in that stuff. We're not talking that he himself is an idol worshiper. A person that took advantage. Why do I care that these people are foolish? At least they bring me income. I make money. Without me, they'll make it somewhere else. It's not that I'm the reason they're going to worship this idol. It's a question. If you sell cigarettes in your restaurant, you're promoting cigarettes? If you wouldn't sell it, the smokers will get it somewhere else or no? It's a question. You can say yes, you can say no, depend. So Rambam says, The idol is not an idol yet until the last second, until you finish the last thing. You finish his ear. You make the holes in his nose. Whatever the case is, he gives you an image of an idol to make. So as long as the idol doesn't have the full, complete, complete shape of an idol, that means the scene is not completed yet. Right? If there was a Buddha without a head, would they agree to worship it? Right? If you take out the ear of it, the, the guy that bowed down to it every day, would he agree to buy it? No. So as long as he didn't finish it completely, technically he didn't violate it, violated the serious sin. Still, of course, not the proper thing to do. Someone that take junk from an idol worshiper and found in a junk, he bought in a junk, you know, container, whatever, and he found over there some idols, all kinds of puppets that they worship, Maria, JC, all these things. It happens a lot, by the way. Or when you buy a house, you find them, they, they leave it in a closet, whatever. What do you do with that? You bought the whole thing, or you bought a car, and you opened the trunk, and you saw some junk there, you're about to clean it, you find uh, some of their dolls and their statues or whatever. Now we have a dilemma what to do. You paid money for it. If you return the idol to the, to the Gentile and ask your money back, 
It's like you're returning it to him and he's gonna worship it again. Are you allowed to hand him an idol to worship? If you destroy it, you say it's not fair. It was mekach ta'ut. I never had an intention to buy it. I bought the whole thing by, by kilo. If you gave money but you did not touch the idol yet, that means you don't own it yet. You can just ask for your money back. Nothing happened. If you already picked it up, the idol, or you took it, or you moved to your possession. So let's say you took it, but you didn't pay him the money yet. Is yours? You're supposed to give him the check later, or tomorrow you give him the cash. Even though that when you take something from a non-Jew, before even you just mashach it, you just got it. Even, oh, even if you give money to a non-Jew for something, the law is, as long as you did not grab the thing, you never owned it. That's between Jews. You have to do Meshicha. If you give Vini money for something that you're supposed to buy from him, and he says, I'll deliver it to you tomorrow, you already own it before you got the delivery. But by the Jew, you don't own it. You only will own it until it gets to your position, to your home or to your hands or inside your trunk, which means you did Meshicha. So here, if you gave uh, the idol worshiper, you gave him money for the container, but you did not get the stuff from the container yet. And then you found out there is an idol over there. You can ask for your money back. It's not considered that you're giving him back the idol because it's called mekach ta'ut. I never had intention to buy this. Same thing if you buy chametz on Pesach accidentally. Somebody comes and says to you, do you want to buy this uh, vacuum cleaner? Look, it's worth uh, $1,000 in a store. I'll give it to you for 500 Wow, beautiful. OK, it's yours. Let me buy it. You buy it. You give him 500 You bring it home. You say, wait a minute. Let me see what's inside. You open it. You see chunks of breads inside. Pesach. In your home, every second you have chametz in your house, three seconds, three sins from the Torah. It's already two days in your garage. Million sins already. The answer, relax, not, no sins. Why? You can only buy chametz if you have intention to buy chametz. Somebody puts it in your property, you don't violate any rules. Right? Even though chatzero shel adam konalo shelo midato, there's a rule in the Talmud, that the, the yard of a person buy items for you even when you're not aware of it. You're in Florida. A treasure fell from the airplane and hit your grass in your backyard. And it touched the floor. Your neighbor cannot jump quickly and take it. You don't know about it. It fell. Once it hit the ground on your house, it became yours. But what happened if there's uh, expensive whiskey bottles inside? What Jew is interested to buy whiskey in the middle of Shabbat? in the middle of Pesach. So you're not interested in that. So even if it fell in your property, technically your property should buy it from you, even when you're not aware of, since it's clear that you're not interested to get chametz after you clean your whole house from chametz, you have nothing to worry about. Let's see some of the other laws here. All kinds of shapes that the idol worshiper made for beauty, not to worship it. They made it for beauty. For instance, a Christian make a cross, gold cross, and he put it in, uh, in his house. Does he bow down to the cross? Probably not. He doesn't worship the cross. The cross is a symbol of his religion. Does he worship the cross? You want to buy that cross, melt it, and make something from it with gold, I don't know, ring or something. Since it was done for beauty, it's not an idol. You can use it. But if it was done for actual worshiping, you're not allowed. Shapes of animals, statues of animals, all not allowed. The Torah says you should not have those statues in your home, in your property. Idol worshiping and everything that is relates to it and everything that was sacrificed to it, everything that touched it automatically become forbidden. Touched it. 
Something touched that idol, already got the impurity from it. How is it? There is things that was sacrificed to Avodah Zarah got mixed in something. For instance, you buy a cabinet, beautiful cabinet, $10,000. One piece of wood inside that cabinet was taken from an idol. The rest is not. But one piece, I don't know, the, the bottom piece, the top piece, you know, they used it from there and they put it inside. Is the whole cabinet forbidden or no? Or well, since the majority is not from idol, from any idol, maybe it's no problem. The answer, Avodah Zara Shenit Arbeva Betsurot Shel Noi. Idol, an idol that got mixed in something for beauty, something that was made from beauty. Even if it's one thousand, one thousand, a screw, a screw from these huge cabinets is inside that cabinet, throw everything to the Dead Sea. That's what Rambam wrote. If a glass of idol worshiper got mixed with other glasses, or a piece of meat got mixed with other pieces of meat, everything goes to the garbage. There's no majority here. Rest of the rules in the Torah, you follow the majority. Idol, smell like idol, destroy it. So what are you crying, you hypocrite, when God destroyed the temples of the idol worshippers? Why are you crying? Because you are nothing better than them. That's the truth. If you cry when the idols get destroyed, you cannot call yourself an Orthodox Jew. I doubt that if you can even dare to say that you're a Jew. You're 100% pure Erev Rav. Go look at yourself in a mirror and cry. Maybe Hashem will have mercy on you that you can do tshuva and start using your head. Apparently, it's not working. You have the nerve to criticize the people that speaks in the name of the Torah and to have empathy to people who make God angry every second in a creation here. He gives them oxygen and they bow down to pieces of wood. You're not ashamed of yourself. Especially when no one came and say, oh, they deserve, or they, oh, it's good that it happened to them. No one said that. It was respectful. So the, the, the places of the idol are destroyed. What's wrong about it? It's, everybody knows it's idol worshiping places with all these big statues over there. Horrible. You're not allowed to even look at that. Sometimes, you know what, I tell you something. In one of my videos, my guy, that the one that makes me the film, he, when I spoke about religions, fake religions, he showed a one second picture of all idol worshiping from India. Do you know how many letters rabbis from Israel wrote to remove it right away from the video? You should see. Strict criticism. I didn't even know what they're talking about. I had to look for it. Where is it in the movie to tell the guy, cut it out? Because he's a bad shuva. I didn't know that law. He put one second picture of all of them bow down to their idols and what they do with the flowers there around the idol. In the film, so many people that saw it in Israel started to attack. What is this? It's a scene from the Torah. To look at the face of these people or to look at them when they do their idol worshiping. tree, that they bow down to the tree. That's another form of idol worshiping. They used to worship trees. I know none of it makes sense, but it's reality. What can I tell you? I wish I had better things to talk about. But this is existing today in the world. Today, not 2,000, 3,000 years ago. Many people write sometimes, the idol worshiping of the old days doesn't exist so much in our days. You're dead wrong. It exists exactly like it was back in the day. They worship rats, they worship statues, they worship all these things back there in Nepal and in India and in China and all these places. They do it. And again, remember, for me it would be a lot better to endorse them because they are not Jew haters like our neighbors in the Middle East. Our neighbors in the Middle East are calling for our destruction and to kill our children. And I say right here open in front of the camera, those murderers are not idol worshippers. 
The people back in the East, they are not calling for our destruction. They are not calling for the destruction of our children. They are even our friends, some of them, like Japanese and others. And what does the Torah say? They're all idol worshippers. You should not have any empathy to them. That's it. That's the Torah, not me, not me. I didn't write the Torah. Here's what the Torah says. I'm reading to you from the Jewish Book of Laws. You, don't, you disagree with it? So you say you're not a Jew. What do you want from me? It's, your, it's not my problem. You don't want to go with Hashem. You're against him. But leave me out of it. What do you want from me? I don't get it. I'm telling you what the Torah says. You want to accept it? Beautiful. You're on the right path with Hashem. You don't like it? You disagree, meaning you think you know better than him? You don't like his ways? You're, it's your problem with him. What, what are you blaming the man, a person who delivered the letter to you? He is the source of your problem? You are the source of the problem, not the, the, the mailman that gives you a subpoena or something, or a bad letter from the IRS. So some, they, a tree that they bow down to. You walk in the street, you're dying from the heat. Wow, the sun is killing me. Headache. My head is spinning. Let me hide a few minutes under the tree. There's a shed here. You're allowed to go under that tree or no? To enjoy from the shed of that tree or no? Allowed or not allowed? Not allowed, asur li shev betzel komata. Not allowed to sit under the shed of that idol. What is the tree fault that some foolish people made it a god? Why the tree has to suffer? Why you cannot take fruit from the tree? Why you cannot use the wood from the tree? Why? Because people made it a god? The answer, Hashem wanted to show us how much he hates this kind of idol worshipping. That's why I always warn Jews. I also warn Jews. They also get angry. The truth always hurts. Always hurts. But how many honest people say, thank you for saying the truth? There are. I'm not saying no. Most cannot handle the truth. When I say you worship a rabbi, it's just as bad. Living rabbi, dead rabbi, doesn't matter. You're worshipping just the same idea, idol worshipping. <laughs> Why? I never saw I never saw one Muslim, to the best of my knowledge, maybe I'm wrong, I'm not an expert in everything they say. I never heard in a history ever in my whole life dealing with them, writing, listen to what they say, sending me emails from all over the Arab world. I never saw one Arab or Muslim that believed that you have to connect to God through a human being. Maybe they admire Muhammad, they admire Ali, they admire all kinds of things. Yes, I'm not saying no. They believe, but to say you cannot connect to Allah unless you connect first to Muhammad and then to Allah, I never heard. Maybe I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, please show me the source. Oh, that's a different story. But that's no, of course, they commit crimes against Hashem. The fact that they hate Jews make them all, all, right away all criminals. Every Gentile that had the children of God actually has a problem with God. But you cannot call him an idol worshiper. Well, technically, if you already mentioned it, Rabbi, let me go a little bit further. It wasn't my plan, but you brought it up. There is an important book of Rabbi Volvi. Rabbi Wolby was a very important mashgiach in the Jewish world. He wrote in his book, he said that really in reality, there are two categories in life and that's it. You, can, you have to be in one of them. There's no in between. Do you either Hashem worshiper or you an idol worshiper? You either Hashem worshiper and if you're not Hashem worshiper, follow Hashem with devotion and only Hashem and not Milvado, you for sure an idol worshiper. He goes very, very thin. What's his point? You believe in your money, so you give the money power that he doesn't have. Because remember, the money is also from Hashem. The money doesn't have his own power. You give people power. You give all kinds of things. You give the college power. You worship the, co the college is going to bring me salvation. The psychologist will bring me salvation. 
my honor and my name and my reputation, that's what's going to save me. All these kinds of thinking fall into idol worshipping. It's a modern idol worshipping, he writes. I couldn't identify more than, his, than with him than, his, than what he said, word by word. Actually, his son sits next to me in a shul yesterday in Shabbat, two days ago, when I f found out that he spoke about it, and also in the editions in the end, my eyes almost came out from happiness. I said to it, you know what? Your father was brilliant. I've been thinking about this for years, how people worship all kinds of things, thinking that's what's going to save them. And he said, I'll give you a copy of that book. So I'm going to take that book and make a lecture from his words, because it's word better, more than treasure. And this was a giant rabbi, not a politically correct fake, a real a real, that person that came from, by the way, in case you don't know his history, he came from, I think, Austria, Germany over there. His parents were ultra, ultra educated seculars. And in his young age, he became a Baal Shuva in a most sophisticated, advanced educational world of Europe. And he came out of that nonsense and became one of the biggest rabbis in the world with not only brilliant books, a perfect example how to be a Jew. Sitting on a bus, down to earth, simple, Ruach HaKodesh, all his life devotion for Torah, for Avodah, Avodah Al Amidot, brilliance in Chinuch, brilliance in psychology, brilliance in things that you never heard. Similar to Rabbi Avigdor Miller. Some rabbis, they're not only great scholars, they're great in everything. Some rabbis, you know, they're very good in halacha. That's their field. And now they don't know about psychology so much. They don't know about other things. Halacha, they're expert. One rabbi, you ask him any question about interest, possible interest, company, stock market, everything he knows. This is his field. He put 30 years of his life into this. Ask him about the psychology of the human mind. He knows a little bit. He's not an expert in this. But some. They read the person, they, they feel you, they know everything. You come to complain about one, in two minutes you already know what really bothers you is this. I heard one time a, a CD of him about raising children in yeshivot, in dorms. About po potential problems that yeshivot may have, that your father has to pay attention to. I, 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 I couldn't come out of the car when I got home from the driveway from being so shocked and impressed at the same time, how he was speaking about things that you wonder to yourself, how did he know all these things? What, did he go and sleep there with the boys now in dorms in our generation, and he saw everything that may happen, and not have, how did he know all these things? It's one thing you learn in yeshiva, and you learn, but in reality, how, does he, how did he know about all these things that exist? And, Whatever, that's not the point right now. Before we finish, time is as usual running out. We have 15 more minutes. Let's see how we conclude as much as we can about it. There are many laws that are similar. I don't want to read similar things because we already got the concept. A mikveh. Back in the days, there was no showers at home. So they, everyone had a public shower. You come, you pay, and you take showers there in the pool. And they put one of their idols over there. But they don't come to there to the bow down. They just put it for beauty. You're allowed to enter that room and go into the mikveh and, and wash your, 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 yourself over there or no? I want to refresh your memory. If you're an electrician and you have a job inside the church where they praying, the Christians, you're not allowed to step inside, even for a job. You don't believe in what they worship. To stay in the place where they worship their idol, you're not allowed. You want to fix something inside the mask, you do allowed. You're allowed. All the Hindu temples, you're not allowed to step in. Many of the Israelis, they, I used to learn with someone that back in the days was in, in India, he went to see the places before he became a Baal Shuvah. 
when he told me that he went to those places in India when they have all these huge idols made from pure gold, maybe like three or four flights, huge, worth mil many millions just from the gold. They make it and they make the entrance to their places very, very low. That the only way to enter is to bow down like this to enter. They don't make a regular door that you walk. They force you as soon as you walk in to bow down to their idol. So what the Israelis did, they were very curious to see what's inside. Well, they, I've been here and I did not go into the temples that take some pictures. They didn't know you're not allowed to even look at it. So what do they do? They go in in reverse. <laughs> <laughs> Not that it helped them. It helped them maybe from not bowing down to that idol. But still, ay, 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 ay. So, yeah, yeah. Speaking about Nepal, there's something else they found out. You know, sometimes only when a tragedy happens, you discover some things you never knew. Do you, did you know that there are hundreds of babies are imported from Nepal to the gay couples in Israel? Do you know how they do it? They take Sid, one of the two gays, the husband or the husband, and they send it by mail, I don't know how they do it, to Nepal. They pay money to a woman from Nepal. Over there, I guess it's very cheap. You give her a few hundred dollars maybe. I don't know how much they pay. And she agreed to go to a hospital and inject the seed into the egg. Or they do it in a lab. They fertilize the egg. And she's like an incubator mother. She, she give birth to the kid. It's all legal. They do it. Of course, it's, it's illegal. But they go around the laws. And they import babies. The first picture in Israeli newspaper, this scam came out. And it's very interesting because one of the things the Talmud Yerushalmi says is that because of the sin of homosexuality, a destruction comes to the world. So they go, they produce babies over there. Not, nobody, of course, thinks that this poor baby will have two, two fathers and not one mother. Baby to grow without a mother, it's not such, such a simple thing. Even to grow without a father is very hard. Very hard to be an orphan from a father. But it's 10 times harder to grow up without a mother. Baby needs his mother. Even animals, as soon as they're born, they're attached to the mother, not to the father. Even in every secular court, they always take the mother's side. Even she doesn't deserve it. Why? It's for the interest of the kids. She cheated. She did horrible things. She's not such a great mother. The judges understand what they're going to do. Give the kids to the father. He's going to raise them. How is he going to? It's for the interest of the kid, they always try to give it to the mother. Unless if she's really a drug addict, or alcoholic, whatever. Then he sees that it's going to destroy the kids. But other than that, they always take the mother's side. In Israel, in America, everywhere you go. Why? It's the nature. How? You cannot go against the law of nature. Kids need a mother. What are you selfish one that because of your crimes against Hashem, you cannot have kids? So you go around the problem by importing kids and raise them with two men and destroy them and make them messed up in their head. How do you expect these kids to have normal life when they grow up, when they don't even know what a mother is? What do you expect them to be in life? There's hundreds of people I met over the years that their life is destroyed because of the way they were brought up, by words that their parents did or lack of love. There is a kid that is a total junkie with needles. His father didn't have time for him. His father is a righteous man, very righteous. But because of his job, he didn't have time for them. The kid became complete junkie. Every day is alive is a miracle. Nothing helps with him, not rehab, no nothing. So one time they asked me to give him a ride. Take him to your lecture, make him a cameraman. A few years ago, I took him with me to Brooklyn one time. The fact that he'll be your cameraman and he would listen to your lecture because, you know, we give him money. Some rich guy was willing to sponsor him, that he will come. I, I need a camera guy. What do I need a camera guy for? Bring him all the way here, hours, just to, for the one minute he turns the camera on. I don't need him, but it was an excuse. Like, he has a job. He gets paid, but, yeah, but what the problem is, as soon as he put the camera, 
he went far away and you didn't see him until the lecture ends. Uh, this junk is very hard to get their attention. So what happened in the end? And the way I asked him, why is like that? I said, look, look, all your brothers, your sister, everyone is great. Why are you like this? I started to argue. To say that his father is not righteous, he couldn't say. I said, I know, I know my father is very religious, I know, but my father took care of everything in the life, but without, what, not me. Like he feel the way to try to get attention from his father is by doing extremely crazy things to get back at him that he didn't give him enough love. This is only a result of not giving enough love to a children. Two men who goes to work. How are they gonna raise this kid? How are they gonna give him a mother's love? Kids need their mother. As soon as they're born, where are they going with their mouth? To their mother to feed them. You take it away from her, I don't know how these people do it. That's what happened in a corrupted world, that the court approve it and the marriage become legal against Hashem and everything becomes corrupted. And then when someone stand and scream what God say, he is the criminal. He is fanatic. He is, uh, what they, they have all these words. I don't even know what they mean, but whatever. All right, so let's, Marash, before we finish. So the reason you're allowed to go into that mikveh is because nobody comes to that um, place to take a shower to worship that idol. But in a church you're not allowed to go because they come to that place to worship that idol. Do you understand? It's a place of tefillah. What about a reform shul? Let some people make parties in reform institutions. What's the law? Inside the place where they're praying, you cannot step in. Not for party, not for chupa, not to do anything. But if in the same facility they have a catering hall, some say it's allowed. You can rent it and do it over there. Because you're not going actually into the place where they are praying to their nonsense. Yes? Is it also considered idol worship, the reform, or is it not idol worship? Different kind of, this, they're more count as criminals who rebel against Hashem on purpose gather together to rebel against Hashem. First of all, you know many of the reformed Jews don't believe in God? Does it make sense to you? I can show you many of their interviews that they say they don't believe in God. I don't understand why they call themselves reformed Jews. They don't believe in God. What's the point here? Why you even come to synagogue? Maybe it's a club. Some believe in God, but don't believe the Torah is from God. What Arabs and Christians believe, they don't believe. So <laughs> who's worse? <laughs> Muhammad that knows that God gave the Torah to the Jews. He's not denying it. And this guy, he say, God never gave the Torah. So what are you following, my friend? What are you following? Where are you going? Why are you going to the synagogue? Why you bought the Torah for $40,000 from Israel and you put it if you don't believe it's from God? That's very interesting. Because some of them declare they don't believe in God, even some of the rabbis. Some of the rabbis don't believe that, that it's hard to believe. How can it be? He's a doctor, he's a PhD, but he said the Torah was not from God. So who is it from? He doesn't have an answer, but he makes up a thing. Why? Because then he knows what's going to be next. You ask him, so if it's from God, why are you violating Shabbat? Why are you gay? Why are you eat pork? Why are you try to murder your wife a year ago by hiring a hitman? It's all against the Torah, no? So what's easy? Ah, the Torah is not from God. That's what they do. they do. But the interesting thing is that when they need to buy Torah, they could buy chumash, $10 in a bookstore, $50 with the English subta, a translation. $50, this chumash here, this blue one, $50 in the store. What do they need? The original scroll for $40,000 written with an orthodox sofer in Yerushalayim, two years work. What for? Anyway, you don't believe in it. Anyway, you don't keep one law from it. Why wasting 40,000? <laughs> the answer, they have money like sand. Why they have so much money? Why almost all the money goes to them in the world? Read Parashat Vayet Hanan, the last three verses, and you understand why. It's written in the Torah, why? Don't be surprised. 
It's a part of the plan. Last three verses, Parashat Vaitchanan. Now, since time ran, ran out almost completely, an idol worshiper, an idol worshiping of the Gentiles, that they canceled it before it came to the hand of the nation of Israel. In other words, before the Jews occupied that place, they took out, they had a church, they took out everything, no more idol worshiping in this place. They canceled it. Before it came to the hand of the Jews, are we allowed to enjoy from that thing or no? From the building, from the facility, we want to buy it, sell it, real estate, make commission. The answer, if it's not active, yes. It's not active anymore. Sheneemar, Pesile Elohem Tisrefun Baesh, Kesheba'u Leyadenu, Vehem Noagim Baem Elohut. When they got to our hand, while they're still worshiping them, like a god. Avalim Bitlum Arem Mutarim. But if they canceled it already, then it's permitted. The idol worshiping of an Israel, of a Jew, Judah worshiped it. Ena betela le'olam. Even if he stopped worshiping it, it's already a curse on it for eternity. Can never enjoy from it, ever, even 50 years later. Standing in some storage, 50 years. Nobody bowed down to it for 50 years. It's full of dust. You cannot use it, ever. Afilu haya lovet kochavim ba shutfut, even if it was 50-50. Half of this statue owned by a Jew, half owned by a Goy. Many Jews, unfortunately, joined those cults. And they need sponsor for all these idols. Who do you think pay for that? So Itzik and John bought it, 50-50. And one day they dismissed it. They put it out of commission, whatever. Maybe it was too old for them. They got a different one, whatever the case is. Since a Jew owns some percentage in it, it's forbidden for eternity. <sighs> when you have a war with another nation of Gentiles, a war, and you occupy the place, and you find idols over there. But the Gentiles ran away from the place. They left it over there. You came to occupy the place. You thought they're going to fight back. In the meantime, they ran away from that city. The city is vacant. You cannot say, oh, they dismissed it. Look, nobody's here to worship it. We found the place empty because they ran from fear. But if they left the city in time of peace, and later on, you went and occupied that place. But they left it regardless of a war, first on their own. And nobody worshipped this place. You can say they neglected it, and you can use it. You can sell it. You can melt it. Look how important are the laws. Three days before the holidays of the idol worshippers, you're not allowed to take from them anything. Not candy, not things, not gifts, nothing. Not allowed to take from them. Or not allowed to sell to them any food or candy or anything because it's a very high possibility they buy it for their idols. You're not allowed to borrow from them or to lend to them. To collect from them debt or to pay them debt. You're not allowed, three days before. Why? Because that's their nature. They're preparing for their idol. But you can sell them something that you know will get spoiled for sure in three days. If it's three days before, he wants to buy uh, some vegetables, they get rotten right away. One or two days, that's it. They're not good anymore. Remember, there was no refrigerator back in the days. You don't need it in a day or two, it's already warm. Today, put it in the refrigerator so you can stay a week, maybe. Look how much the Torah was strict about maybe he will use it. Let me make money, Hashem. Parnassah is very tight. Why do I care this guy is going to bring this speech in front of his uh, idol? Do that means I believe in it? I only want to make money. 
Hashem said, I don't want you to be indirectly connected to this act of field. Don't worry about money, I'll take care of you. The business bring you money? You really, really think you make money from selling things? You know, I had one guy, he's in real estate. Young guy, in the beginning of his way, he comes to my lecture in Brooklyn every Tuesday. He came to me a week ago, two weeks ago, excuse me, no. He contacted me Sunday before last Tuesday shiur by email, writing to me that he has a very good opportunity to sell a church and make good commission. Sell a church or to buy and sell. I don't remember all the details anymore. I asked him all kinds of questions, he answered me. The answer was he cannot do what he wanted to do. With no question asked, he gave up all the lot of commission, not one peep. He came to me two days later in the shiur, he said, I dropped the deal. Don't want to enjoy from it. Idol worshiping places. I remember one person here in Queens that didn't sell anything for almost a year. Was borrowing and borrowing and borrowing. One time, he finally found a customer to a property that he owned around Jamaica Avenue in that area. Finally, he's about to make his first deal. As he was telling me the details, he said that they want to make a church from it. <laughs> I said to him, what, you don't know enough how to sell them a building to make a church? The rule is, if they have other buildings in the area or other uh, houses that they can buy, not yours, they buy here, they buy here in the same neighborhood, with or without you, then you're allowed to sell it to them. Because they'll buy it anyway. You cannot prevent their idol worshiping one way or the other, it will get done in a block. But if nothing in this area to be rented, and you're the only facility that is for sale, and they cannot get anywhere else, you're not allowed to sell it to them. Because if you do, Every time they get God angry in that place, you're going to have a share in it. For the lousy $20,000, $30,000 commission that you made, you're going to pay such a price, you will regret the moment you're born. What do you think? With Hashem, you get away with things? What do you really think? Didn't you read the Tanakh at least once in your life? Don't you read in the Torah that everyone who worshiped Baal Peor got destroyed completely? Not only they suffer so much in slavery, Finally, they're coming out of Egypt. The idols back in the day had power, not like today, nothing. People went to idols because they saw sometimes immediate res results because Hashem was confusing and testing the people. The miracles of Hashem were clear and only open. The idols also, certain things happened with them because Hashem has to balance the free choice. So people that had a problem, they went there not because they don't love Hashem. They want an immediate, the kid is sick, he's afraid. He goes to the, some idol and does something. And what happened? Nothing left from them. Hashem wiped them all out. What about empathy? It was only one time incident. And it's such a stupid idol worshiping to bring what you throw in the bathroom, to bring it to the statue over there, Baal Peor. By the way, where is Moshe Rabbeinu buried? Across the street from that idol, Baal Peor. But nobody knows where he was. Moshe Rabbeinu is across the street to shut the mouth of the Satan that he used this despicable act of Jews that went there to sacrifice to Baal Peor. They put across the street the greatest Jew in history. Nobody knows where it is because Hashem didn't want people to make Moshe Rabbeinu an idol. If people would know where Moshe Rabbeinu is buried, <laughs> you wouldn't have 20,000 people go there every year. It would probably would be from 7.5 billion people, half of them would be there. <laughs> you wouldn't be able to get there. So many people want to come because even Muslims idolize Moshe and Christians and others. <laughs> half of the world. Days that the Goim gathered together, all the idol worshippers, to make themselves a king and they sacrifice to their gods. This is a day of a holiday for them. And it's like other holidays. But an idol worshipper who make a holiday for himself 
and he thanks to his fake God and prays it and give him credit that the baby was born thanks to his help or whatever the nonsense is, right? Or he makes a party for any other incident that happened and say thank you to that God. That day, it's only forbidden to that particular goy, not to the rest of goyim. So with other ones, you can do business, because for them, it's a regular day. He only is the one. So with him, three days before, you don't sell to him, you don't pay him, you don't collect from him, nothing, because you don't want to have a share in his crime against Hashem. If you are in city that Gentiles occupied and they're idol worshippers, like Christians, they occupy the place and they're starting to build their churches and other things, or Chinese, or whatever the case is. If Arabs occupy it, they make masks. It's not idol worshipping. You live there, you pay them the tax, whatever they want. Hopefully they leave you alone. City that becoming an idol worshipping place CD like that, you're allowed to get out of there, but once you go out of there, you're not allowed to come back in it. You leave the place, to leave, to go out from that place is mitzvah. To go into that place, to live there, not allowed. So why today Jews go to places that Christians make churches? Because the idol worshiping of the Christians is not as bad as the idol worshippings of Nepal or India and other places. Because they still believe in our God, but they believe in somebody else. It's called shituf, cooperation. They take two and, they, and give another one. It's also a violation of the, of, the, of the Torah and the seven laws of Noah, but it's not as bad as those who make a statue and bow down to it. A Jewish baby not allowed to breastfeed from a woman that is an idol worshiper that raised her children to be idol worshiper. Bottom line, Chinese woman that bowed down to one of those idols or woman from India and all these things, you're not allowed to use them for milk. But let's say you had no milk and your Arab maid, she just gave birth to her kid and she has milk. You're allowed to take from her? Yes. If there's no other way and the baby is hungry, you're allowed, but not from an idol worshiper. You're not allowed to make peace with the seven nations that live in Israel because they're all idol worshippers. You're not allowed to have mercy on them. You're not allowed to make agreements with them. You have to warn them to stop or they all get executed. Not allowed to have mercy on them. Not allowed to make compromises with them. You either stop and you start keeping the seven law of Noah's and we allow you to stay here in the land, or you run away from here, or you executed by the law of the state. It's written in the Torah. What happened? If you're a doctor and they ask you to be their doctor for money, the idol worshippers, are you allowed to be their doctor? Are you allowed to send Israeli doctors now over there and take care of all the idol worshippers from the Torah? Are you allowed or not allowed? Forget feelings, forget your common sense, forget what people would say, forget about the politics. What's the law of the Torah? No. Arabs now fail. They need help, they want you to be their doctor, you're allowed, they're not idol worshippers. Somebody who bowed down to an idol, you're allowed to go and cure him that he can continue to worship his idols? You learn from here, שאסור לרפות עובדי כוכבים ומזלות אפילו בשכר. Not allowed to cure them even when it's strictly business. Not because you have mercy on him. You just want the money. Still not allowed. 
But if you're afraid of them, and they can get you back if you won't do it, you're allowed, but with collecting money. You're not allowed for free. So technically, here is an example how the people in Israel bragging that they do a mitzvah. They go there and they volunteer and they pay from their own pocket, and of course they don't collect any money, when they're actually violating the rules of Hashem. If they were collecting money, that's a different story. But they're not collecting money, they're violating the rule of the Torah. Huh? Goodwill is also worth money, for sure. We're not allowed to sell idol worshippers' houses in Israel. Not allowed to sell them fields. You can sell them fields out of the border, meaning in Syria and other places if you own them. If a Jew owns a property in Syria, he can sell it to a Chinese guy or an idol worshipper from India, but as long as it's not on a holy land. Meaning even here in New York, you can sell him a home. But like I said, if he wants to live there, and if he wants to make it a temple to his idol, then you're not allowed to sell it to him. You're not allowed to dress like idol worshippers. You're not allowed to talk like them. You're not allowed to use their names. You're not allowed to imitate them in any possible way. They decided to wear certain kilts. You also want. Not allowed. You're not allowed to imitate their laws. Be careful. It will be a trap. You have to be different than them in any possible way, in your ideology, in your thinking, in the way you function, in your opinions. You must separate serious separation between you and their idol worshippers in any possible way. Oh, we like you, we have the same thing. No, no, no. You worshipping your idols and we worshipping only one God. As God say, I separated you from all the nations to be my children. Do not imitate them. Do not follow them. Don't be like them. Don't get married to them. It's a list of restrictions in the Torah who leaves us no choice. You're not allowed to have haircuts like them. You're not allowed to shave the sides and make long hair here because that's what they used to do, the idol priest. Blorit, what we call Megadel Blorit. Not allowed to make ponytails like some of them had, some idol worshippers. So many other things that we can say. You don't know which one to say, which one not to say. That's why there's so many laws. We, we, we basically could have made a series from this. Exactly. Idol worshiper Cohen is dismissed. <laughs> Last thing for today. Someone who persuade a Jew, whether he's a man, whether he's a woman, to be an idol worshiper, come, come, it's going to help you. Bring, bring your kids. Let the, the monk from the idol worshiping temple give him a blessing or anything like that. His punishment is death by stoning. Come, come to the Baba. He has special powers. It's going to touch you with your hands like this, and you feel much better later on. Whether this person who persuades you is a false prophet, that is mitzvah to kill him, whether it's a regular human being, doesn't have to be a false prophet. He doesn't have to say 
God gave me a prophecy and that's why you have to all go and bow, bow down to this idol. No. Even one of the cult, people from the cult, Jews from JC, and they come and hunt Jews to follow this ridiculous cult. Same thing over here. That's what we're talking here about. Someone who persuades the majority of the city, of, of the people of the city. He, he convinced them all to worship an idol. Somebody like that, that comes and speaks in the name of God. God told me to tell all of you that if you're going to do this and this and this in front of this tree, that's what's going to happen. Don't worry, it's good. It's the name of God, the God of the Torah. That's a false prophet. Somebody like that, death penalty. Do you have to give a warning to this person before you execute them like other people, like someone who violates Shabbat? Before execution, they had to give him a warning. You know what you did is against the law. Somebody who comes and convinces Jews to come down to worship JC or an idol or, or their gods, whatever. Do you have to give him a warning? Next time when you do it, you will get caught by the police here and get executed or no? The answer, no warnings. No warnings. Just witnesses. Witnesses that say that that's what he said. That's what you do. Who has to kill him? The judges? The police? The professional executor? The one that he tried to convince to come worship their idol. He is the one who's supposed to do it. Ay, 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 ay. If people only knew what idol worshiping is, they would be so careful from that. They will run from it, like running, not from fire, from anything you can think, the worst thing. Not only they don't run away from it, they endorse it. They write nice things for it in the internet. And someone who read what the Torah say, they criticize him with dirty words, and then they don't even think what's going to be the consequences of what they do to themselves, to the world. What these people know from their life? Whatever they do, they do. And eventually, they have to face their actions. You understand? So this is it. That reminds me what happened uh, six, seven, eight months ago when this Jewish woman married this Muhammad, which is against the Torah. And they all, 50% of the people there that were screaming and cursing were Israelis who were wishing them Mazal Tov. They don't understand. What do you think, that it's racism? What do you really think? Do you think it's racism? No, it's what the Torah said. Religious? You're religious, you have to represent the Torah. Not what you like, not what you identify with, not what you believe, not what you think we should do, no. You only can promote what the Torah says. That's it. That's it. Now, I'm sure there are many Jews who met somebody at work that she's not uh, Jewish, and she's such a wonderful lady, and pretty, and nice, and smart, and rich, and love him, and give him attention, and she saved his life, and who knows what. What would he want? Of course he would want to marry her, out of his desire and feelings. We are not coming here to condemn or promote what he thinks right, wrong, what we think is right or wrong. It's not in our hand. Remember, the difference is when someone like Adolf Hitler come and say we have to kill all handicaps. That's his opinion. That's why he's a criminal. When he say we have to kill all black people, that's his opinion. That's why he's a criminal. When he comes and says we have to kill all Jews, that's his opinion. That's why he's a criminal. When a Jew comes and reads in a book of God that Christians and Muslims admit that is the book of God, there's no debate about it. Everyone agrees, the three main religions. And remember, most of the problems in the world as far as getting killed is between Christian, Jews, and uh, Muslims. Either the Muslim kill us or the Christian kill us. The Chinese didn't kill us. The Nepal people didn't kill us. The Indian never killed us. 
It's either Christians here, Europe, in America, some of them move to America today, you know, they build here another place. The Europeans, the Russian helps our killer, and the Muslims, this is it. This is the same usual enemy. So the point that I'm making here is, when we read in the Torah that Christians also read in their churches, and Muslims also read in their schools. And I say to my listeners, we're not allowed to marry anyone from any other nation because this is what the Torah says, and I'm reading it from the book of God. That makes me a racist. Is this my decision? Did I invent that law? I made it. I thought it's not proper. Nothing to do with me. Whether I like it, doesn't like it, I'm not a factor here. And anybody else who would read from the Torah, whether he's a Jew, whether he's a non-Jew, same thing when a non-Jew reads something in the Torah that we don't like to hear. He's right. Doesn't matter who he is. He's not a racist. He's right. When the Arabs scream to the Jews, we're going to torture you because you don't listen to God, what can I say? Unfortunately, they're right. We don't listen to God. If we would listen to God, they wouldn't be able to touch us with their finger. What did Sheikh Yassin that started the Hamas wrote? in the foundation of the Hamas declaration. What did he write? The Jews got all the chances from Hashem and they betrayed them more than once. Our job is to punish them. That's how the Hamas started. You understand? Religion, 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 only religion. And who does it to us? Hashem. Do you think the Arabs do it? Hashem does it. Do you think the Europeans did it? Hashem did it. Do you think Obama is doing it? Hashem is doing it. So why are they getting punished, all the anti-Semites? Why the Egyptians got punished? Why Paro and all these people got punished? They did what Hashem wanted us to get. Because they enjoy doing it. They enjoy, they chose, they like it. They don't have second thoughts. For that they get punished. Do you understand? This is it. So here is the rule, and that's with this we conclude today. When you read from the book of God, and it's not your opinion, that's the freedom of religion, like they say in America. Like they now put on the buses, kill Jews. You saw that uh, the, the, the court approved? What was the answer of the judge? The judge that approved it, is he an anti-Semite? I don't know, not necessarily. Maybe he married to a Jewish woman, I don't know. As far as I'm concerned, I don't know who he is. But by him approving the signs to kill Jews and all that, it doesn't tell me that he's an anti-Semite guy. No. Because the judge wrote in his answer, we have the Constitution of the United States. I didn't write it. I'm a judge. I'm, I'm binded to rule based on the law. Doesn't mean I like the law. Doesn't mean I agree with the law. I have a friend who's a judge in San Diego. He told me the same thing. There are sometimes someone in my courtroom that if it was up to me, I would send him to prison for the rest of his life. Clear to me that this person another day or two will murder his wife or whatever. But what can I do that the law told me maximum four years? It breaks my heart and I send him to only four years. That's what happened. What do you think, I agree with the laws? Many of the laws are stupid in my eyes only, also. But I cannot do it. By us, Baruch Hashem, we can chas v'shalom not say that the laws of the Torah is stupid, God forbid. Who can say that the laws of God is stupid or he doesn't know what he's talking about? You don't understand? Say, I, my mind didn't understand what God, why God said it. I never had the merit to understand. I, my opinion is the opposite, but because I see it in the Torah, I'm keeping my mouth shut. That's the right way to talk. You agree, you disagree, don't dare to say I disagree with God. Don't dare to say I don't like that law. Don't dare to say this law doesn't make sense. Be careful, those sentences have a price. Be very careful, you're going to pay a price for it, don't be a hero. One sentence will cost you years, years of suffering, if you know what it is. What do you think, it's a joke? Read the Tanakh, learn from other people's mistake. One sentence that even holy people said destroyed their life. Nadav and Avihu, the two sons of Aaron, what did they do between me and you? If you'd say today that two Jews, religious Jews, did what they did, 
and they got killed by lines of fire who came into their nose and burned them. No one would be able to understand why. The father Aaron did not make a peep, nothing. Hashem knows what he's doing. Who am I? We, we understand everything. Learn to keep your mouth shut when it's necessary. Not everything you have to express your opinion. Somebody says something you disagree with, you're allowed to ask him, can you show me your source? That's legit. He didn't read the whole Torah, he doesn't know. The stupid things that people were speaking today on the Facebook show you that they never opened the Torah once in their life. Because every little kid that learned once in his life Torah already know these rules about idol worshipping and how horrible is this. Those Jews who call themselves Orthodox never ever read once in their life the laws in the Rambam. Guarantee. If they read it once in their life, they'll be so embarrassed to write the nonsense that they wrote today. They wouldn't be able to look at themselves in a mirror how stupid they are. Not only they don't learn, and then they write rabbis. They know, Baruch Hashem, they know. And then we wonder why we're suffering so much. Even Moshe Rabbeinu at one point had a crisis in his emunah in Am Israel. Do you know that? He said, now I understand why Hashem is punishing this nation. Moshe already started to have a second thought. This nation deserves to be saved, Bechlal? If he would live today, do you think he would say to Hashem, I put my life on the line that he wouldn't say it? When you see all these liberals anti-Torah and how much they hate rabbis and the Torah, what makes Moshe want to save these despicable people? What? What would make him want to save them and pray for them to get saved? when they spit in the face of Hashem and the face of the rabbis non-stop, and they call themselves orthodox. Okay, the other ones, what do you expect from them? You understand what's going on here? Conclusion, stay away from any connection to idol worshipping. Idols of Gentiles, idols of fake religions, rabbis that made into idols, the chair of the rabbi that people bow down to, giving all kinds of power to people as holy as they are, that they have the divine power and they can save you. This is all idol worshiping. Some war, some not as bad, but it's all idol worshiping. Before you're gonna be very surprised after being religious all your life, keeping mitzvot, and then you come in front of Hashem and He will tell you, my friend, you're an idol worshiper. You have no share to the world to come. Imagine the tragedy. Seven years you're religious and in the end you don't even have a share to the world to come. Why? Because you promote on the internet the idol worshippers and have empathy for them. When you know I hate so much idol worshipping and I am the one who strike down the temple of their idols. Just like I promised in the Torah that I will do. Just like the law of the Torah. So you go against me? You go with them against me and you call yourself religious? Think again if you're religious. Baruch Adonai Leolam, Amen, Amen.